My new novel is called The Poe Shadow, and it takes place in Baltimore between the years of 1849 and 1851 when Edgar Allan Poe dies and one of his admirers wants to solve the mystery of his death. Everyone assumes that Poe died a drunk and had died from leading an immoral and debauched life. And our one reader wants to prove that Poe's name should be saved and that his legacy will survive. And he opens up an investigation that becomes a mystery that spirals out of his control. Our protagonist begins to look into questions that he realizes the police are ignoring and that some people, including possibly Poe's own family, are trying to cover up. So our hero recruits a famous detective who is the basis of Poe's character, who was the first detective in literature. And our hero brings him back from Paris to solve the mystery, except that another man claims that he was the basis for Poe's detective character. And it begins a race between the two detectives that puts our hero right in the middle. The book does have a lot of room for humor. In fact, I felt it had more room than my first novel, The Dante Club, which was a pleasure for me because the characters are very quirky and very strange and our protagonist has to try to negotiate between a whole set of bizarre characters in trying to both get to his goal of saving Poe's name and also of saving his own reputation and name, which becomes at risk as the story develops. Edgar Allan Poe was one of the first authors that really got me excited about literature. I first read his stories, and in fact, the first stories I read were his detective stories when I was in high school. And I think it was the first thing I read that I realized there was another layer of meaning underneath the surface level of meaning. So Poe, for me, was always a symbol of what we could discover in literature, not just what you see on the page, but what's between the lines and underneath the page. And of course, that's part of what a mystery is about, too. So it's a, a perfect combination, especially for an author like Poe, who invented detective fiction. He invented what we know of as the mystery genre. And in fact, 2006 is the 165th anniversary of Poe's first detective story. I think one of the things I enjoy most as a writer is that historical fiction allows you to mix in real history, real research, with your own fictional characters and fictional events. And I always like to feel like I'm learning something while I'm reading without being lectured to or without being instructed. And so for me as a writer, it's important that all the history feels authentic, but also is part of an entertaining story. And so a story like this lets me put in fictional characters who I want to learn more about and explore with a real history that I think readers will be interested in. In this case, the mystery of Edgar Allan Poe's death, which has remained a mystery since 1849. One of the exciting parts of this novel for me is that as a historical novel, it's actually presenting new information about history. So Poe's death is something that we have tried to figure out for 150 years now. And when I started researching for this novel, I didn't expect that I would find anything new because people have been looking at it for that long, for 150 years. But I've actually been very fortunate to find five or six new pieces of historical documentation that have never been presented before and they appear for the first time in the context of this novel. So it's an unusual chance for a historical novel to present new history, for a historical novel to add to history. And as a writer, that's just a real thrill to know that our genres aren't so separate. Um, sometimes scandals erupt when a nonfiction work is discovered as partially fiction, but it can work in reverse in an exciting way in that fiction can also be partially nonfiction. I'm always thrilled that people will tell me that they listened to the audiobook of my first novel, The Dante Club, and how much they loved it. And some people will read the novel and then listen to the audiobook, or the other way around, they'll listen to the audiobook and then read the novel. And they never fail to mention how other dimensions will come out in the audiobook. So for me, it's almost like cheating 
to seem like a better writer because the audiobook will always bring out elements that you might not even be aware of in terms of the way the dialogue adds to the story and the way a story sounds, which of course is different than a way a story reads or looks on the page. And that's absolutely part of our tradition as storytellers. Of course, storytelling began as an oral tradition and something that I'm very interested in. So the audiobook allows us to reach back and discover that element of a story and really let us absorb a story in a completely different way. So I always encourage readers who like the book to also listen first to an excerpt of the audiobook from the Simon Schuster website or from my own website, and then go out and try the audiobook at a bookstore or at a library and see what else they can discover about the story that they might not have noticed in reading the book. Mm -hmm.